Darren reports from Free Geek in Portland. This segment is brought to you by Crash Plan. And so for those, it requires absolutely no level of technical proficiency. And even for our build program, our, the very first thing we ask people to do is take the hardware ID workshop where they are going to learn all of the core components, components of computers. And so we don't ask them to have any advanced technical expertise. Um, <laughs> but at least show you what's going on over here. Um, so the build program is meant to be very accessible. Um, it's also kind of tailored to how comfortable you're, you know, you feel with your learning. So um, the first step to the build program is here hardware ID, um, and you only have to take this once. But if you feel like you want to marinate on that information more, you can absolutely take it two, three, four times, whatever it takes to kind of make you feel comfortable. We're gonna introduce all the different computer components to you and talk about them and uh, show you some old, old examples and uh, some newer stuff that we're looking for for our specifications of, on what we're rebuilding currently. Um, so yeah, we're just going to go over all the different computer parts and components and teach you all about them. So that's step one, hardware ID. Yeah. <laughs> so is everybody at Free Geek a volunteer? No. We do have paid staff here. We have over 35 paid staff members. Um, and. We average between uh, of between five and six hundred active volunteers a month, and those are volunteers who come in and give at least three hours of their time. We do have many volunteers who are here much more than that, who will see, uh, you know, three or four, and sometimes even five days out of the week. Um, but we are uh, staff. We are staffed. We are. Um, but we are very much volunteer powered and our volunteers are important to us in terms of what they offer and what we're able to offer them. And so how does Free Geek sustain operations? In 2012, we were 100% self-funded. We, uh, approximately 20% of our income came through our recycling. And so that was recovery of precious uh, materials and our participation in the Oregon eCycles program. Approximately 20% of our income came through donations at the front door. Every time people drop off items to us, we um, do a, offer them a recommended donation amount, and we're happy to take none, and we're happy to take the recommended. And it's wonderful that people in Portland really support what we do here and are often willing to give more than the recommended donation amount. And then approximately 60% of our income came through uh, sales. And we have a thrift store that's open Monday to Saturday, 10 to 6, that offers a wide range of electronics. You never know what you're going to find there because we never know what's going to come in the front door. Uh, and we also sell things online through eBay and Amazon. Um, and all of those can be found on our website. So you say you've been with the organization for five years now. What's some of the stranger things that you've seen come in the door? So I, I started volunteering with Free Geek five years ago. Um, and then I was in the build program. I, at that point, I didn't get to see my, many of the strange things that come in because they often get filtered out by the time they get there. I've seen some uh, amazing computer cases. Uh, one of the most interesting things that came in in the past couple of months was an AM, FM portable radio that was shaped like a gun with a actual holster as well. And clicking the trigger, it turns it on and off. I mean, it was a really unusual design. I'm not sure who thought that would be intelligent, but, uh, and this is prior to the age where we put the orange, uh, orange plastic on the fronts of anything that could look like a real gun to indicate to police that it's not. And so this looks like a very real replica. Um, we've had a couple of things come in that we haven't been able to identify at all. I mean, with you know all foreign language on it and nothing that we could figure out how it was supposed to function or what it's supposed to do. It's pretty neat. Uh, I definitely recommend one of my favorite areas to volunteer in Free Geek is actually uh, in the sorting area because you get to see all of the material that comes through here and you just get to find some really fun, interesting finds. Uh, but so this is the build area. This is where you'll be spending the bulk of your time uh, in the build program. We'll start you off by quality control testing, uh, five or six systems, um, maybe some laptops if we're out of systems at the moment, uh, but that'll get, get you familiar with the testing process. Then you'll start working on the six computers. Uh, you'll use some checklists here. Uh, we've got teachers and uh, staff on hand available to help troubleshoot and answer questions. Uh, we definitely encourage peer-to-peer -peer learning also though, so um, you know, if you're 
you notice your neighbor struggling with something that you just figured out, go ahead and give them a hand with it. Um, you know, sharing of information and helping each other out is a lot of what makes Free Geek go, so uh, carry that on with us. Challenge um, and you love Max and you want to uh, figure out how to refurbish them, this would be the place for you. Uh, they're definitely challenge, challenging. You might have to remove like 34 star-shaped screws to get into one little area of manipulating one little thing and then prying and taking more things off and uh, <laughs> yeah, so definitely challenging yet rewarding. Uh, so you might be wondering where the other five systems are going that you're building for us. You're going to keep the sixth one. Uh, some of the other five will go to adoption volunteers. Some will go to our hardware grants program where basically we grant out tons and tons of computers to local churches, schools, nonprofits. Um, we've given over 7,500 away since our inception in 2000. Um, so yeah, that's good. Um, you might build some higher end or lower end systems for sale in our thrift store. We like to keep a wide variety of different spec'd out systems available to the community for cheap prices. And um, yeah, thrift store also supports our operations. So uh, that's kind of what's going on with that. What about like historic computers, you know, things of that nature? Oh, yeah, I mean, it's it's great. We do have some wonderful, uh, we, we had something prior to your visit about two weeks ago. We took them down, haven't put them up yet, but we did have a historic museum in our thrift store. And we've seen some amazing uh, older systems come through here. We, many of them though, we actually have donated to OMSI, which is the Oregon, Oregon Museum of Science and Industry for them to put on display there because we know that they can do a better job of preserving these for the future. And so we didn't want to be hoarders about them. Um, but we should have some, still some interesting older technology on display in some of our volunteer areas and at the front desk soon. We just haven't had an opportunity to get to that again. So what are some of the challenges that, uh, that face the organization as personal computing moves more towards things like tablets and smartphones, and how does FreeGeek uh, adopt those things? I mean, this is, yeah, this is a huge issue for refurbishers everywhere. I mean, it's just getting harder and harder to, ref you need greater skill sets to refurbish technology. And you see the iFixit repairability scores, and these things are, the, you know, the newer items that are coming out, the repairability scores are pretty low. You're seeing fours and fives out of 10. Um, and it's a, it's a shame because we really want to be able to provide opportunities for anybody to participate in the refurbishing process and to learn about computers. But it's becoming, it's requiring these greater skill sets in advance. And so that can be very difficult. We will need to modify what different volunteer opportunities we offer to people and the way that we're training them to go through the process. And we really do need to consider how we are, um, how we want to vet people as they continue through the process to make sure that they're learning successfully from it and that they're successfully refurbishing these materials and not doing damage to them that's irreparable if we bring in somebody else to help with it. And so that can be very difficult. And it forces Free Geek to really consider what is it that we want to offer to our community? Is it necessary that people become, be able to refurbish computers for us to offer them the skills that they need? Or what should we focus more on our classroom education and the skills that are gonna help people be employable and, and work well in an office environment? And so we could very easily uh, ch start to shift our focus from hardware as hardware becomes something that requires more specialization to more of a service-based organization that provides uh, very reasonably priced uh, tech support that you can count on to different people, both individuals, nonprofits, and other organizations that offers the classes and the learning opportunities. And right now we're in the middle of doing our strategic planning for the next five years. And I'm hoping that out of that comes a vision for Free Geek that really takes into account the difficulties with the miniaturization of technology and how that affects what we do here. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's really awesome what you guys are doing with the desktops. And those, those are all like IBM clones, if you will. And all of those are standardized components. And, right. and like you were saying with the laptops, like, well, you know, maybe if it's within 
say, a Dell Inspiron family, you can swap some things around. But for the right. most part, everything's proprietary. A lot of them, it, it only gets more so exactly. with tablets and smartphones. So have you guys uh, taken on any initiatives to, to refurbish tablets or smartphones? We have. We've done some work with that. And a lot of that, we haven't institutionalized it well yet. And so a lot of that has been finding individual volunteers who have expertise in these areas and having them work on them. In this past six months or so, we've really been trying to do a lot more to bring that out of a small room and create more, um, more procedures for working with that that can be shared with other volunteers. And we haven't struck on the best way to make that work yet, but that's something we are refining as we go through this year. And I'm hoping that within the next you know, six to eight months, we really have some opportunities in place for our volunteers to learn more how to deal with these uh, more individualized technologies and proprietary technologies. Uh, we are, in our laptops area, we generally have asked people to go through our entire build program before they can go into laptops, but we are offering this month and next month two four-week-long workshops where people will be able to learn about laptops directly and skip everything with desktops and not learn about those. So that we're hoping that we will get more trained volunteers in here who can help us produce more laptops. So it makes it, it makes it so we can make more laptops available. And we're also hoping that we can offer people the skills that they want to learn uh, so that they can learn to fix these for either their own personal use or possibly, possibly for remuneration in some way. Mm -hmm. And so give me the, uh, the back of the book, uh, like, I walk in the door, I want a free computer. What do I do? Um, so if you, if you want a free computer, it depends on whether you're a nonprofit, school, church, or community change organization, or just an individual. But assuming you're a, a person off the street who just says, I'm ready for a computer, I need one, what's the quickest way I can get it? I would recommend going through our adoption program where you would come in, take a tour uh, at either 11 o'clock or 4 o'clock, Tuesday through Saturday, and you would learn about all our different volunteer opportunities and get a safety training, which is really important. We don't want anybody getting hurt here. And uh, after that, you would sign up for volunteer shifts. And you could, if the volunteer shifts are available, you can work eight-hour days and put in three eight-hour days and be ready to receive a computer. At the end of that, we do ask that people take a free two to three hour course that will introduce them to their computer, let them set it up and quality control it themselves to make sure everything's working correctly. Uh, people are not required to do that, but by doing that, we offer them one year of free software support through tech, through tech support. It's very user friendly, very antivirus, uh, but it's different for a lot of the community who are used to working with Macintosh or Microsoft operating systems. Um, so I recommend taking our getting started class. Um, basically for the adoption program, you're gonna to wanna to complete those 24 hours, sign yourself up for the getting started class. It's three hours. We'll take your machine that you've earned into the classroom, quality control test it again, uh, make sure everything's working properly. Uh, we'll help you set your preferences on your machine. We'll help you download some free applications that may interest you, uh, give you a history of Linux and kind of just literally get you started on working with that. So uh, it's about a three hour class and you get a year of free tech support for taking it and you don't if you don't. So there is a good enough reason to take it right there, but um, it's also interesting and good. So <laughs> um, we have about 20 something other classes. They are all free and open to the community as well as volunteers. So I highly- We do this for two reasons. It's helpful for us uh, because our tech, if they're trained in, in the ways in how to use their computer better, they won't have to call into our tech support as often, straining our limited resources. And it's also great because we know we're sending somebody home with a computer that they're ready to use instead of a doorstop. And that's really important to us. We want these computers to get used. Uh, for people that have more time and more interest in getting involved in the technology, we would recommend that they go through the build program. And through that program, you learn all the basic components of a computer, you triage the systems that are coming in to see whether there's something we're able to reuse or not and whether they're functioning well uh, or the different components are functioning well and what we might need to retest or what we might need to recycle. And after you sh demonstrate a comfortable, you're comfortable with our hardware that's coming in and our processes, 
You are able to move into the build room where you will start by quality controlling the work of other builders. Then after you quality control the five other builds, you would build five systems and then the sixth system you get to take home with yourself, uh, for yourself. Uh, that program takes a fair bit longer than the 24-hour adoption program because you have to go through a lot of different steps, but you also, also get a much greater appreciation for, uh, and knowledge for electronics and computers. And so what's next for FreeGeek? What's next for FreeGeek? Uh, other than the obvious answer of taking over the world with uh, you know, proselytizing open source software, being kind to your environment, and trying to reuse your, your materials for the benefit of the community, um, it's hard to say. I mean, we, I think that we're going to see, I would love to see FreeGeek really be able to continue to grow the services that we offer. I think that would be excellent. And I think it'd be really nice for us to uh, continue. Obviously, I come at it from an education background. That was how I was originally hired into FreeGeek as the education coordinator. So I see a lot of advantage to us really developing our education program and offering something online that we don't currently offer. And so we're looking at different ways to record our classes, develop interactive modules through open source software as well so that people can learn regardless of where they're located and whether or not they can make it into FreeGeek. Um, yeah, right now we're just really happy to be in such a wonderful community that's very supportive of the work we do, that understands the importance of being ethical in the recycling that you're doing and understands the difference between uh, dropping off your computer with a recycler who's going to just take it and shred it right away and put all this energy into uh, breaking it down to core components just to build new computers out of it versus an organization like ours that puts a focus on community education, on opportunities to learn job skills, and, um, and actually reusing the components how they are, which requires a lot less energy output. Uh, computer Lab is free and open to the community as well as volunteers. We've got a two hour max on uh, com computer access and a little volunteer 10 minute limit one. Um, Linux is on all of these computers, so uh, definitely check that out on your breaks. Uh, we've got a little baby library here of Linux related books and programming stuff. Um, so you can rent out any of these books at the front desk for two weeks and bring them back. Those are free books. Yes, sorry. Um, so these may be not as Linux related or maybe a little older. So where do people find Free Geek or a Free Geek like organization in their area? Uh, I would I would recommend well freegeek.org is where you will come to find us, the Free Geek Mothership, the first one. Uh, on if you go to wiki.freegeek.org, we actually provide a lot of the documentation that we use to support this organization because we want other people to take that information and use it themselves. And that includes links to several other free geeks around uh, the U.S. and in Canada. And my recommendation is to Google yourself uh, to Google um, responsible uh, recycling or computer reuse or. Um, you know, environmental disposal of electronics to see what you have in your area. And hopefully uh, where you live has a progressive program like we have here in Oregon, uh, the Oregon E-Cycles program, we really put a focus on recycling all of this e-waste that can otherwise be very dangerous to the environment. Cool, Darren, thanks so much. My Appreciate pleasure. It. That was yeah, a good time. Great timing. Yep, yeah. absolutely. I'd like to take a moment to welcome our newest sponsor, CrashPlan. Now, I've been using CrashPlan for years and I never thought I would be this excited about off-site backups, but let me tell you, these guys are doing it right. First of all, your data is for your eyes only, and that's why CrashPlan offers the best privacy guards using Bruce Schneier's open source Blowfish Cipher. So you can generate and import your own private key so it's never stored on their servers. What's more, CrashPlan is cross-platform with clients for Windows, Mac, Linux, even Solaris. And couple that with the truly unlimited backup. Seriously, I personally have a couple of terabytes up there. You can see why I'm so excited. In fact, the CrashPlan software is so flexible, it'll back up any file, not just to their off-site servers, but to your very own external hard drives, even your friends' computers for free. As hackers, geeks, and IT professionals, we know the importance of off-site backups, but get this, as Hack5 viewers, we're getting a very special hookup. From now until July 31st, 2013, we're getting a huge discount on their one-year unlimited plans. Now, normally they 
they start at a totally reasonable $59.99 a year, which is about five bucks a month. But if you go to this very special page just set up for us at crashplan.com slash hack it up, you'll get a whopping 20% off. That's like a year of unlimited backups for less than four bucks a month. Now, it's never too soon to back it up, so I highly encourage you guys to take advantage of this July-only offer at crashplan.com slash hack it up. It's time for my favorite part of the show, the Technolust photo of the week, and this one comes from Ryan. He sends us this photo from his tech space, and he says he's running two servers, a Windows 8 desktop, an old MacBook running Ubuntu, a Raspberry Pi, new MacBook Pro running three monitors, a Wii, Apple TV, Wi-Fi Pineapple, <gasps> a rubber ducky, eight computers total, five monitors, a TV, a total of eight terabytes of space. Holy crap, Ryan, that's a ton of stuff. How do you keep up with everything? Wow, that's nuts. That's like, I think my home computer layout is like, if not half of that, maybe? Anyway, you guys can send your photos over to feedback at hack5.org with the subject line, Tetanalust, if you wanna be seen in next week's episode.